live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about the episode, The Balance of Terror. Now, this is the episode in which the Romulans are introduced, the first of the two major antagonist species in Star Trek, the original series, um, the other being the Klingons. So basically what happens in the Balance of Terror is that the Enterprise is going to Earth Outpost 4. Uh, or they're, they're going along and they get a distress call from Earth Outpost 4. There's a series of Earth Outposts built on asteroids along the border of the neutral zone between the Federation and the Romulan Empire. Um, the Romulans... The Romulans and the Federation had fought an interstellar war a century earlier um, because the ships were more basic. No one had ever been able, no one had been able to take prisoners. Like if your ship got destroyed, you were just toast. Um, there had been no vis visual ship to ship communication, so no one had seen the others. Um, the Romulans were basically just sort of a mystery, and then. For a century, they just hung out and did Romulan stuff while the Federation hung out and did Federation stuff, and there was really no contact. But then, Federation outposts start getting destroyed. Just asteroids, star bases, whatever, whatever, the, whatever they've got on there, just totally annihilated. And the Enterprise has to figure out what's going on. What they figure out is that the Romulans have both a cloaking device, which is bad news bears because you can't see them coming until they are about to fire their weapon at you, and they have a sort of energy plasma weapon that annihilates everything uh, in front of it, even the hardest substances known to Federation science, just obliterated. Um, the Romulans have destroyed a number of star bases in this way. Um, and so the Enterprise has to decide what to do. They can confront the Romulans and potentially get destroyed themselves. Um, they can try and fight the Romulans and potentially destroy them in Federation space, which would leave no room for doubt that the Romulans had been the aggressors. Or they can break their explicit orders um, and cross into the neutral zone, which the Romulans would consider an act of war, and they can fight the Romulans in the neutral zone. The big problem, of course, is that the Romulans have a cloaking device, and so the Enterprise can pick up a sort of 
slight distortion on their sensors, and so they can generally track where the Romulans are, but they can't really see them. So the Enterprise starts following the Romulans. One of the Romulans uh, sends a communication back to uh, the Romulan High Command, or whatever it is, and that actually allows the Enterprise to spot them much more precisely, and they manage to... Uh, Spock manages somehow, despite the fact that the Romulans are cloaked, which is below past that for the purposes of this, um, Spock manages to uh, get visual contact with the bridge of the ship, where, bum, 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 the Romulans look like Vulcans. And so, uh, Mr. Stryker? Sorry, Styles, Lieutenant Styles. Um, Lieutenant Styles is basically like, mm, I'm going to be pretty distrustful and racist now because Romulans and Vulcans look very similar. So I think Spock must be a spy, or at least working on behalf of the Romulans. Kirk, uh, very, very properly, uh, very, very ethically, tells him. Leave any bigotry in your quarters. There's no room for it on the bridge. That does not stop Styles from basically being super distrustful of Spock, etc., etc. And then basically most of the episode is spent with this sort of cat and mouse game uh, where the Enterprise and the Romulans are facing off with one another. Both Kirk and the Romulan commander are trying to anticipate and get in the other's mind, and etc., etc., um, and interestingly enough, they each think that the other is doing exactly what he would do in that instance. So that's interesting. Anyway, eventually, the Romulans manage to damage the Enterprise, but not enough, and the Enterprise destroys the Romulan ship, or rather, the Enterprise incapacitates the Romulan ship, the Romulan commander calls the Enterprise, well, Kirk calls him and the Romulan commander is basically like, well, you beat me, I'm going to blow up my ship now. And Kirk's like, no, don't do that. And then the Romulan commander, who's played by Mark Leonard, interestingly enough, um, Mark Leonard later reappears in the series as Spock's father, Sarek. So in some ways, there's not, like, Styles' suspicion of the Romulan-Vulcan connection is not entirely unfounded by, by that sort of that connection of that actor playing the two roles. But uh, the Romulan commander is basically like, hey man, we are, we're soldiers, we do our duty. My duty is to destroy this ship rather than let you capture it. But he also says, we are of a kind, you and I. In another reality, I might have called you friend. So that's another interesting element that we'll, we'll talk more about. Um, as that's going on, in the in the, the final climactic battle, uh, Styles and this other guy, Tomlinson, who actually we started off the episode where Tomlinson and um, um, Ensign Martin, uh, they were they were in the process of getting married when they got interrupted by the whole distress signal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Tomlinson and Stiles are in the phaser control area. There's a phaser coolant leak. Ah, uh, they're being poisoned. Spock has to sort of run back in there from down the hall after, after Stiles was just a bitch to him. Um, Spock fires the phasers, allowing them to defeat the Romulans. Then he drags uh, first Stiles and then Tomlinson out. Tomlinson does not make it, so the episode actually ends with uh, Ensign Martin in the chapel, and Kirk going and basically being like, sorry, your fiancé is dead. His death helped avert an intergalactic war. So, you know, it's, it is what it is. Uh, and and Styles is basically like, I'm sorry, Mr. Spock. I was pretty racist toward you, and then you saved my life. And Spock was like, yeah, I saved you because you're a decent navigator. I don't, I don't care about you beyond that. So you know, uh, fair play to him for that. But uh, so the big, 
social justice element here is very obviously racism, issues of, of racism. Styles' distrust of Spock on the basis of his physical appearance being similar to that of the Romulans. Um, now, the thing that's really interesting about this, it, so my, the way I look at it, in the, in the geopolitical cosmology of Star Trek, the original series, remember this is the 1960s, 66 to 68, um, this is Cold War. The Klingons are the Soviet Union. The Romulans are the People's Republic of China. So they're both antagonists to the Federation, which is the US and broadly speaking, the West, NATO, um, the, the opponents of the two enemy species. And the Vulcans are the Japanese, highly technologically advanced, very similar in some senses to the Romulans, um, but quite different. So uh, if the Romulans are the communist Chinese and the Vulcans are the Japanese, especially in between the 40s and the 60s, well, the 40s into the 70s, um, the U.S. had much more direct, large-scale interaction with East Asia than we had traditionally had in the past. And that ended up sort of manifesting itself in a lot of different, a lot of different racist ways. Um, I think the best, actually, example of the kind of issue, if, again, especially if we think about this in terms of China and Japan or Chinese and Japanese people, it, the best comparison is during World War II when East Asians of all different national backgrounds, Chinese, Koreans, um, Southeast Asians, people from Vietnam, from Cambodia, wherever it was, found themselves targets of anti-Japanese prejudice. Actually, the, I think it was the U.S. military issued pamphlets or po posters or something like this on how it was how to tell a Chinese from a Japanese. And, I mean, the spirit of it on some level was good in that it was like, not all Asian people are Japanese. Don't, don't beat up or lynch your Chinese neighbors or your Korean neighbors or whatever it was. So that's an admirable element of it. But the methodology there was this like very reductive racist, here's the physiology of Chinese people versus the physiology of Japanese people. And it was very, I mean, it was predictably very unflattering for the Japanese. Uh, because the U.S. was in a war with Japan, and Japan was the enemy. So, this idea of, like, people who physically resemble one another becoming targets of racist violence is actually a recurring issue in U.S. history. More, more recently, after September 11th, a lot of people with brown skin, even who were not Arabs or Muslims, found themselves attacked, sometimes often physically attacked, out of anti-Arab, anti-Muslim prejudice. Um, I remember there were Sikhs who were hospitalized because they were severely beaten, even though Sikhs are not Muslims. It's a completely different religion. Um, but because Sikhs, most Sikhs tend to be from South, uh, Southern Asia, from India, Pakistan, that area, Bangladesh, that area, to Americans who were on the lookout for terrorists, anybody who looked South Asian or Middle Eastern was potentially a terrorist. There were actually Hispanic people, people from Mexico or Central America or wherever it was, who were attacked for being Muslim Arab terrorists, even though they were Hispanic. So, like, this idea of racism sort of transcending and applying beyond 
people of that actual race or ethnicity is a recurring issue in U.S. culture. And in Stiles' distrust of Spock, we have that issue reflected. Another interesting social justice element, I think, actually deals with international relations. And it's the sort of parallelism between Kirk and the, and the, the Romulan commander, Mark Leonard. His name's not Mark Leonard. The actor's name is Mark Leonard, but you get what I'm saying. Um, they each several times say, oh, the other commander is doing what I would do. I'm going to use what I would do to figure out what he's going to do. And they try and sort of, they strategize based on a set of assumptions about the other person and a set of almost empathetic understandings of that other commander's position. Now, that's really interesting because on the one hand, that is about empathy. That is about putting yourself in the position of someone from a different cultural background and trying to imagine how they see the world and how they would approach a particular task. And that is actually a really, really good way of humanizing humanizing others, humanizing people that on the surface may seem quite different from yourself. So that's a really good that's a really good thing. Um, empathy is an incredibly strong tool for building human connections. At the same time, one of the things I find and, and actually the fact that the Romulan commander is like, we are the same in a different reality, I could have called you friend. That's a very cosmopolitan, empathetic gesture to recognize that the other person, the per, even the person who is actively destroying you, if it were not for the war that neither of you created, the conflict that neither of you created, you had more in common than you had dividing you. But the other element of this, the thing that I find really, really interesting is that Romulan culture is very different than Federation culture. I say very different. Realistically, they're both, they're both military organizations focused on the expansion of their influence. The Romulans are more militaristic about it and the Federation tends to, to rely more on diplomacy, but essentially they are they're somewhat similar. That being said, they have no way to know that. The, the Romulans and humans have never met face to face. They've never uh, been in actual contact with one another. They haven't talked for a hundred years, etc., etc. It is very interesting, very striking to me that each of these commanders is able to correctly assume what the other commander is going to do based on what he would do in that person's place. That assumes a degree of cultural homogeneity that's not necessarily a fair assumption. P even, even human beings from radically different cultural backgrounds will often approach problems in diametrically different ways. And so, that assumption of if I would do it X way, I can anticipate that this com this other commander from a very different culture will do it X way as well. It's it's a limitation of the sort of empathetic thinking of these characters. Their their vision of the other's character is as themselves in a different uniform, essentially, and so. That, I mean, that's always a challenge when you're dealing with um, very different cultures or people of very different cultural backgrounds. How do you figure out what they're going to do if their worldview and their frame of reference is very different from yours?